Hello, welcome to China Tonight. I'm Stan Grant. On the program, June 4 reminds Hong Kong residents once again how times are changing. Our government gets in the way of online gaming. And is China slipping on gender equality? First tonight, what's making news on the platforms people use? Weibo and WeChat, where more than one and a half billion people communicate every month. Now joining me is Yvonne Yong. And Yvonne, while it might not be officially recognised, the crackdown on pro-democracy protesters in and around Tiananmen Square in 89 still makes news on social media. That's right, Stan. After more than three decades, June the 4th remains one of China's most serious political taboos. The Chinese government's vigilant about suppressing memorials of this date, but in perhaps another sign of faltering relations with the United Kingdom, the official Weibo account of the UK embassy in China posted a picture of a candle, understood to reference the anniversary. But within hours, the candle was being reinterpreted. Some Weibo users suggested it meant the Queen had passed away and of course the hashtag the Queen of the United Kingdom passed away emerged quickly on the platform. Mr Hu Shijin, the editor-in-chief of the nationalist tabloid Global Times said in his post that the UK embassy played petty tricks. The joke about the Queen was a heavy price paid by the embassy for its provocative post. Not everyone agreed. Christina Scott at the British Embassy in Beijing claimed on Twitter that the image was censored within 20 minutes and it later disappeared entirely. Now, the hashtag Gaokao was making waves also this week with 11.47 billion reads and more than 13 million comments. Gaokao is the Chinese abbreviation for the annual college entrance exams, a huge deal in China. Running over several days in June, 10.78 million students, a record this year, sat the entrance exam for almost all higher education institutions at the undergraduate level in the country. But COVID is continuing to present challenges in Guangdong province where there has been a new wave of cases. Authorities set up special venues and transport for students and all Gaokao teachers have been vaccinated. And in the capital city of Guangzhou, there's even a one-on-one -on -one shuttle taxi service for students living in COVID hotspots. And finally, a young student's impassioned speech on a reality show has raised eyebrows. The 17-year-old student, Zhang Shifeng, attends Heng Shui High School, famous for its militarised teaching style and outstanding Gaokao results. In a recent episode of Super Speaker, the young contestant said he was a countryside pig determined to ruin cabbages in urban areas. In other words, Stan, he was potentially looking to date urban women normally out of his league. But his comments sparked furious debates on Weibo. Critics claimed uh, he was being sexist, while others argued he was just pointing out the inequality between urban and rural China. Well, Yvonne, it seems that city-rural divide in China is interpreted in many different ways and still a sore point for a lot of people. Yeah, you're not wrong, Stan. Based on the amount of interest this speech has got online, I think thousands of views and so much engagement, it's definitely sparked a fierce debate, even though it's not 100% clear what Zhang Shifeng actually meant when he <laughs> made those controversial remarks. In news this week, residents in Guangzhou are now under more COVID restrictions as the city in Guangdong province battles its latest outbreak of coronavirus. They're being asked not to leave the city. Those who do need to prove they've tested negative within 48 hours prior to departure. Now, the trajectory of daily cases has been similar to Melbourne's here at home. Over the past two weeks, they've been recording a handful or two of new cases every day. And it's the Delta Indian variant that has authorities concerned. But Guangzhou City's population is more than three times the size of Melbourne's. And a major difference is all 11 districts in Guangzhou are testing all their residents for COVID. Those living in China are also being urged to get vaccinated to build an immunity great wall. It's broadening the age group of those eligible to people aged three and up, still to be approved, of course, and it aims to have at least 70% of this population inoculated by the end of the year.
Taiwan has been thrown a lifeline this week with the US and Japan each offering around a million doses of COVID-19 vaccine to help stem a growing outbreak there. Three US senators flew in to make the announcement alongside President Tsai Ing-wen. But Beijing says Taiwan has been playing politics. Both the US and China are ramping up the distribution of COVID vaccines abroad, but Washington accuses Beijing of pursuing an aggressive strategy of vaccine diplomacy to gain influence and to distract from questions over how the pandemic began. We're not seeking to extract concessions. We're not extorting. We're not imposing conditions the way that other countries who are providing doses are doing. Not so, says Beijing. 在自身人口基础巨大,疫苗供应十分紧张的情况下,中方已经向国际社会提供了超过 while America has pledged to distribute 80 million doses abroad by the end of the month, China says it could provide more than a billion to the world in the second half of the year, mostly to developing nations. As we mentioned before, June the 4th was particularly contentious this year. Hong Kongers have been finding alternative ways to mark the anniversary of the Tiananmen crackdown, since police banned vigils being held for a second straight year, citing COVID restrictions. <laughs> Barely a mention on the mainland, but it was hard to ignore in Hong Kong, where one alleged vigil organiser was arrested, although later released. Now, Stan, she was just one of hundreds who marked the anniversary around Victoria Park. Of course, the venue was closed and there was heavy police presence. But compare this to the thousands mm. who usually attend the June 4th vigil prior to last year. It's clear that Beijing started to implement its national security law and ever since many Hong Kongers are just staying away. And, of course, being able to use COVID to be able to put bans on, on those sort of gatherings this year as well. Thanks, Yvonne. Yvonne, a little later we'll be talking with Ted Huey, who fled Hong Kong last year and now lives in Australia. Nobody can doubt that video gaming is a popular pastime. It's a hobby that more than two-thirds of Australians are said to enjoy. And, of course, things are no different in China. Hundreds of millions of Chinese people are regular gamers. Just like in Australia, some people struggle to regulate their usage. We asked Ang Harad Yeo, video game critic, tech journalist and host of both Good Game Spawn Point and podcast Queens of the Drone Age, to have a look. This is the story of the button in China that switches off video games across the country. China is one of the world's biggest video game markets. Almost half of the country's 1.4 billion citizens are said to play. That's almost 30 times the entire population of Australia. In 2020, the industry pulled in some 32 billion US dollars in revenue from mobile games alone. And esports weren't far behind, with 20.8 billion earned. But across the country, not everyone gets to level up. When China opened the gates to its market back in the 1970s, a lot happened. No, literally, if we ran through it all, we would be here for hours. But as the economy grew and grew, new products started to hit Chinese shores, such as gaming consoles. By this point, Japan was a console powerhouse, home to the Nintendo Famicom. But importing them was super pricey due to tariffs and taxes. To combat this, local Chinese manufacturers started making their own affordable dupes, dubbed Famiclones. Because what's a good dupe without a great pun? There were a few different types, but the Xia Ba Wang, or Little Tyrant, was one of the most popular. Sold as an educational typing machine, it also unlocked the door for many kids to play a ton of games. It even had Jackie Chan in the ads. Fast forward a few decades and the government's tune had changed slightly. One of the strangest things they did is in 2000 they banned console games entirely. So this has basically wiped out Playstations, uh, Nintendos, Xboxes and 
was not back on the agenda for 15 whole years until they lifted the ban. But this didn't stop young people in China from gaming. It just moved them onto something else. What it did by stopping people playing console games is it actually encouraged people to engage in these sort of um, massive multiple online player games, which in some ways spooked the party a lot more. And to that, the Chinese government said, nope. Oh, wait, that was the wrong chord. By 2019, the CCP was so worried about kids getting addicted to games that they installed a curfew. Using what I can only imagine is just a big old switch on someone's desk that says no more fun on it, the curfew cuts off video games for people under 18 between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. every day. What's more, gaming's restricted to 90 minutes each weekday and three hours on weekends and holidays. Ludicrous, I can't believe it. It's absolutely Actually, it's super reasonable when you think about it. In fact, it's pretty much a parent's dream. By this point, you're probably thinking, I get completely owned and flamed by 11-year-olds in Fortnite all the time. How can they possibly know who is who and how old they are? Well, the combo of government data and law enforcement makes it possible for authorities to identify people logging onto a game. The ability to track people's digital footprint in a super specific way isn't all that new or exclusive to the Chinese government. You don't even want to know what Facebook has on you. But as with anything, fences were made to be climbed. Kids and gamers are nothing if not resourceful, so kid gamers are doubly resourceful. Some keen players have managed to get around it using things like VPNs, which make it seem like you're playing from outside China. Or just classic adult login credentials. Gamers got a game. And Uncle Radio is in the studio with me now. Um, great, that's such a fantastic, funny, but so much information in that as well. It's fascinating to me that you create a world, don't you? An alternative world. And in a place like China, where the Chinese Communist Party is controlling everything, that must be part of the attraction here. Oh, absolutely. I think escapism is a really big attractant for all gamers. You can create a fantasy world where you can do and be anything. And especially when you're in a place where there's perhaps tighter restrictions, mm. there's more surveillance on your communication as well, having a place where you perhaps feel a bit more free from that is really attractive. And for the Communist Party, who want to control everything, <laughs> this is a world potentially beyond them as well, isn't it? Potentially, yeah. I mean, you know, we know that they have uh, a big eye on a mm. lot of forms of communication, especially digital communication, and it's a lot harder to police that when you're in a video game that has its own chat system. But what about locking kids out of the game? Um, it may be a good thing in, in some cases, right, if kids are spending so much time on it. What, what are the, the, the good points, the bad points? What, what, what do you make of that? I am a very big advocate of having gaming be a part of a balanced lifestyle. So I don't think that it's really smart to have a kid have absolute free reign just gaming. It's too attractive, mm. it's entertaining, and it's very fulfilling. And obviously a kid who hasn't learnt self-control yet is just going to want to do that entirely. So setting boundaries and teaching them from an early age, hey, play games, have fun, absolutely, but then also learn other skills and have other interests as well is really good. How would it go down here, do you think? I think the curfew itself is really reasonable and actually really clever, and I think that it achieves those things that you want in encouraging a balanced lifestyle, but I think it's the, uh, it's the enforcement yeah. by a government that Australians aren't so keen on. Yeah. Angrad, fantastic. Thank you again. Thank you. As Yvonne mentioned earlier, police prevented residents of Hong Kong from commemorating the 32nd anniversary of the Tiananmen Massacre this weekend. Banning is a demonstration of the erosion of freedom in Hong Kong. And um, some of the organisers are arrested just because um, they vowed to light a candle. So this is an extremely outrageous uh, development. Now, many of the city's pro-democracy activists believe the move is the latest example of Beijing not adhering to promises it made a quarter of a century ago. It was a wet night in the middle of 1997 when the British flag was lowered in Hong Kong. The moment ending more than 150 years of colonial rule in the city heralded a new age. One country with two systems. Promises were made at the time, 
Hong Kong would return to China, but the city would keep a high degree of autonomy and the lifestyle Hong Kongers were used to would continue for the next 50 years. Meaningful change took a while to emerge, but then in 2014, Beijing proposed a series of reforms to the electoral system in the city, effectively giving the Communist Party the ability to vet candidates running for the top job of chief executive. Student-led umbrella protests saw part of the city shut down for 79 days. Movement organisers said the reforms were a betrayal of the one country, two systems principle. Beijing disagreed, saying that the chief executive of the city must love the country and love Hong Kong. The bill was rejected by the Hong Kong Legislative Council. In 2019, the streets were full of violence again. New proposed laws would allow people to be extradited from the city to the mainland. We have to ask ourselves whether we will continue to tolerate this loophole in our system in the return of fugitive offenders to the extent that we will be making Hong Kong a haven for all these uh, offenders of serious crimes uh, all over the world. The bill was withdrawn. The bill is dead. Twelve months later, a national security law was imposed on Hong Kong. Fifteen high-profile activists were arrested on suspicion of organising, publicising or taking part in unauthorised assemblies, including Martin Lee, considered by many to be the father of the democratic movement in Hong Kong. The central government now claims to have comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong, which is 180 degrees opposite to what Deng Xiaoping promised. Well, Ted Hui is a former Hong Kong legislator who fled the city late last year. The exiled pro-democracy leader is now based in Adelaide and he joins me now. It's nice to have you with us. Can I go back to 1997 uh, and that mm -hmm. moment of the handover? I think you were about 15 years old at the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. You've said that that really changed the course of your life. When did you become aware that things were significantly going to change? Only later when I'm uh, at my 20s. Because at my teenage, uh, people at that time, at the 90s, believed in uh, the CCP that it will change, that it will live up to its promises made in the basic law, that we will have democracy we and freedom gradually. Was that naive? Because even at the time, and I was there reporting that, I recall talking to people who were sceptical that the, mm. the one country, two systems was really going to last for 50 years. Even Margaret Thatcher, in her memoirs, mm -hmm. raised concerns about that while she was cutting the deal with Beijing. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, returning Hong Kong to China meant that it would come under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. It's happened mm -hmm. sooner, but it was inevitable, wasn't it? Yeah, if, if you look back from now, people can all be naive from Hong Kong, but that's the only uh, acceptable choice for Hong Kongers because uh, we, we, want, we wanted freedom and democracy, and the only way is to accept China uh, as our country. Let's look at it um, from the other side if we can. Um, the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party, Beijing, would be saying, well, why should Hong Kong have freedoms or rights or democracy that other parts of China do not. Um, they would say, and they do say, this is China. We make the laws mm -hmm. of China. Why should Hong Kong be different? What do you say to that fundamental question of China's sovereignty, mm -hmm. even though it may be breaking mm -hmm. the agreement, but, in, but saying this is our sovereign right? Yeah, but look, uh, over the, uh, the, the years after the handover, Hong Kongers never asked anything more than just freedom and democracy. The fact that we are handed back to China doesn't mean that China can do whatever it wants to us because it's made its promise internationally and locally to its people, to international communities, and even uh, the promise made in international treaties registered in the UN. Now, of course, you were heavily involved in the protests. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you were raising funds, you were organising the protests, mm -hmm. and you were doing this, I assume, in full knowledge that this is in contravention of the national security laws that Beijing was bringing down. Were you at that point saying, OK, this is an act of defiance and you were prepared for the consequences that would inevitably come? Um, 
half and half, because at the first half of the freedom movement in 2019, the national security law was mm. not in place. I felt it's only my responsibility to stand with the people and but to then, be a But then afterwards, when you continue, mm -hmm. continue that, were you saying, well, I know what is going to happen here? Yes, after that, I, I kind of know that uh, it's going to happen. But still, I don't think I will do... Uh, I, I would be betraying my people. Of course, I will be standing with, with the people. You've, you're facing nine charges um, in contravention of the national security laws. There's a, a money laundering charge as well. What would mm -hmm. happen if you went back to Hong Kong and faced those charges? Um, I would be in jail, thrown to jail, definitely, for uh, decades or for life because uh, there's life imprisonment for infringing the national security law. So there's no doubt about it. Hong Kong's um, security secretary, John Lee, has said specifically that he mm. considers these actions um, that you will be responsible, criminally liable for life. That means that you will be pursued for the rest of your life. Does this mean that you now consider yourself to be a political refugee, that you can't go back home and you are looking for somewhere else as a haven? P politically, yes, um, uh, I cannot go, go back home, and even I want to, even I miss home. So uh, I, I do need uh, some kind of protection from other nations uh, because I will be deprived of uh, my personal safety and freedom if I go back home. Is this so ultimately yes. what you'll be seeking here in Australia, that political asylum on the basis that you are not safe if you return to Hong Kong? That's the last thing that I want to do. Um, because uh, I, I want to be self-sustained. Of course, I don't, if, if that's, it's possible, I don't want protections. But if I need to stay in a country, uh, a place for a longer time so that I can do advocacy for Hong Kong's freedoms and democracies, I, I probably need that. But that's the last thing I want to do mm. because uh, I don't want to call another place home. Hong Kong is forever my home. Just a, a final thought from you. You and, and uh, some of your supporters are now uh, locked up. Others have left. You're here and you're unable, as you say, to return to Hong Kong. We've seen these new security laws. We've seen the banning of the Tiananmen protest. We've seen the stronger arm taken by Beijing and very mm. little response in terms of uh, a reaction from the rest of the world to this. Does this mean the battle is lost? We probably lost one battle, but the war is not over. So uh, I believe it's a, a long battle, long war. And for now, what we need to do is to save our power, save our energies, and not to be thrown to jails. So we need to be more organized. We need to develop and to make our uh, diasporic community grow uh, outside Hong Kong. I believe that uh, one day uh, people will rise again. I, I can see the spirit still there. Ted Wei, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you again for giving us your time. Thank you. China's Chairman Mao once famously said that women hold up half the sky. It was a powerful manifesto for gender equality left in the care of the Communist Party. But decades later, equality has slipped and feminist movements trying to bring about change have faced crackdowns. But as Samuel Yang reports, that hasn't stopped the growing number of women who now call themselves feminists. <laughs>
Growing up in China as a kid, I was surrounded by strong female figures in my family, my mom, my aunt, and my grandma. They could easily fit the description of a feminist, successful, independent, and head of the household. While women in China have made great strides towards equality, they still face discrimination in the workplace, politics, and at home. That's fueled a wave of feminist activism, being led by a new generation fighting for women's rights. I'm on my way to meet a Chinese feminist study in Australia to find out what it's like to be a feminist in modern China. Yeah,我上大学的时候,嗯,也是在为一个学生,报纸工作嘛,一个学生媒体。当时在我们学校的BBS上有一个男生说,呃,在图书馆有些女生穿得很暴露,也想他学习。对,然后,啊,我们当时